welcome back to the Korean Hour podcast. I'm your host, Jed Lee Henry, and this is our literature series and a second part of the two-part series that we've recorded with Bruce Fulton. The first part of the series focused more on a deep look at Korean literature, its histories and how it developed and the changes that happened within it. And we finished this first part as it brought us up past the end of the colonial period, past 1945, and into the shell and the structure of a rapidly modernizing Korea. And that's where we're going to pick the story up now. We're going to start with a look at the role of women's literature, the place of female writers, what it used to be, how it has changed and how important it is inside Korean literature. And then we're going to have a really fascinating look into a few specific texts. And these specific texts also drag out the changes not just in Korean society, in Korean literature, but the whole peninsula and what is happening in the time and the space in which these books were written. All three are linked below. The Dwarf by Cho se hu is a look inside that particular moment. This idea of a growing society, but also the separation that's happening inside it. The haves and the have-nots. A modernizing world in which many people are being left behind, but also a world that has so much promise for everyone else inside the society. From there, we move into Kim Sung's book, which is still in pre-production, but can be pre-ordered, which is One Left. A story focused on the comfort women narrative to sex slaves that were taken by Japanese colonial forces during the Second World War. Not just the trauma that these women experienced at the time, but the trauma they had to deal with when they got back to a society that often shunned them. And the difficulty they had over the years to reintegrate and to come to grips with a career that they are struggling to find a place within. It is a complex look at not just Korean nationalism today and how it's developed, but complex morality as well. Which, of course, sends us into the next novel, The Catcher in the Loft by Chon Un Yong. This, again, just as with the previous novels, is inspired by real events. A torture specialist from the 1980s. A South Korean who's living as a fugitive inside his own house. And coming to terms with what he has done in that deep past, in that period of totalitarianism. And where Koreans were at war with themselves and fighting for democratic rule. It's a dual narrative, not just of the man himself, but the daughter who finds herself in this new world and linked back to the crimes of her father in odd and again complex ways. Rather than the first part of this podcast, this is a much more specific look in at these texts. But as you'll see as we do this, it always expands out to the broader Korean context and a broader Korean nationalism. And I should also offer the caveat at this point that I did the first time around, but it does bear saying again, I often refer to Bruce's translation work and the book that we base a lot of the podcast around, which is entitled What is Korean Literature, as works of Bruce Fulton's only. Whereas I should have been making reference to the translation work as Bruce's work and that of his wife, Ju Chang Folson. And when it comes to what is Korean literature, this is a book by Bruce Fulton, but also co-written by Kwang Young Min. And again, this is not something that I make reference to. Bruce is good enough to correct me, but in the moments that I don't make reference to these, I should have. And again, all the books that we discuss in both parts of this podcast are linked below. And I can't encourage listeners enough to go and read them for themselves. Now, as always, this podcast is entirely funded by you, the listener. We don't run advertising in any way on the podcast, and this is a conscious decision, which means all the revenue that we do gain, all the revenue that supports the on-running costs of the podcast, comes from you directly. So if you do enjoy the podcast, and you do want it to continue, it is important that you go to the links below and support the podcast directly if you can. On that, and to walk us through our second half of our discussion about Korean literature, this is Bruce Fulton. Well, before we do get, I do want to speak on those details, and I do want to ask a number of questions about the historical consciousness thing. But before we get there, let's let's pause on that uh, that that question we hinted at earlier. That's the place of women's literature. So let's come back to that briefly now. Right. So uh, reading through yeah. this, I look at my shelf. I have a couple of books from Park Wang So on my shelf. I have your your anthology of Words of Farewell, and you write interestingly when you about this current generation. That I'm 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 going I'm going to talk about a quote that you have. You said that Korean women have traditionally been seen and often seen themselves as first someone's daughter, then someone's wife, and then someone's mother. So, and then you have this new generation of Korean writers that you write are less sentimental, less deterministic, and are really making strides in the field. So how, I, 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 I might get to walk us through the dramatic change and the dramatic visibility that has happened with Korean, with Korean women's literature uh, recently over the last few decades. Okay, so... Um... Uh, we, we should go back to the colonial period and remember Kim Young-soon's story from 1917, 
And we should remember that uh, that during the colonial period, uh, young, educated Korean women, uh, uh, like their male counterparts, uh, participated in uh, in the production of uh, of a modern literature, um, uh, in, both in poetry and in uh, in fiction, not in drama. Interestingly, but uh, that 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 is a topic for future research. Um, the problem uh, problems arose when the discussion i don't uh, i don't like the term discourse but um uh when the discussion of women's issues became public um uh and this was even before the the colonial period um uh it was men's voices that we heard for about for about 20 years or so and it was only in the 1920s that women's voices joined the discussion of women's issues, but uh, but women were um, they were um, they were working for newspaper companies, they were working for for Korean publishers, um, they were members of the coterie groups um, that uh, founded many of the um, of the literary magazines and more specifically literary journals that we see during the colonial period. And um, and their uh, and their voices continued to be heard after after liberation, but um, it wasn't until the uh, the appearance of Oh Jung Hee late in the 1960s and Pa Won So um, in the early 1970s that uh, we began to acquire a couple of very distinct voices for very different reasons. Um, I, I regard these two as the breakthrough, and uh, what what makes Park Won So so precious in uh, in modern Korean literary history was her ability to uh, to empathize. She was a writer of tremendous empathy, whose stories were uh, were often stories of testimony based on her own life. Uh, as someone originally from the north, as um, a member of the first uh, class, the first Korean literature class at Seoul National University uh, to admit women, um, but her studies were cut short. She began her hakban, or her year of entry, was 1950, and of course, three months later, the Korean War broke out, so she never was able to complete her um, uh her, her, her studies, um, but she shared with with millions of, uh, of fellow Koreans uh, trauma res, uh, resulting from loss of family members during the war, and she was able to uh, to reach readers in a very direct and visceral way, to the extent that she became known as the Yup Chip Ajima, the mm-hmm. auntie next door. Uh, someone you could imagine, you know, sitting down over a, a cup of tea, uh, listening to a, to a very personal story, but one that was all too familiar. So I, I can't I can't overemphasize the, the 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 contribution to to modern Korean literature that that Park Won So made. Oh Jung Hee, for her part, was a consummate uh, technical writer who focused on marginal figures in Korean society, who focused long before Shin Gyeong Suk's novel, Please Look After Mom, uh, on how the absence, Buje in Korean, how absence uh, can live um, with a with a family uh, for decades, especially as connected with trauma. So, um, Oh Jung Hee's first story is, is is just simply remarkable. She started writing it in high school, and it involves the same sex encounter between the first person narrative, who's a schoolgirl, and uh, a disabled woman who runs a toy shop. Uh, this was in 1969. Just unbelievable. 
Uh, and for the next decade or so, she would publish about one story a year. And uh, she uh, rather quickly uh, gained, uh, ad, uh, I'd say, maybe not so much admiration as appreciation or recognition from the uh, from the elite, conservative, patriarchal Korean literature establishment for her writing skills. Her, her stories were, were very penetrating. They were disturbing. Um, they kept, um, they, would, they would keep readers and the critics kind of at a distance. And her very first story collection had uh, a very disturbing, disturbing or unsettling, perhaps is a better word, combination of first person narrators almost all of them female uh, who lacked names mm. so so imagine this you've got a first person narrative narrator so you can assume some some intimacy but these individuals remain nameless and um, uh, oh jung he went on to uh, produce another um, three volumes of, of fiction, um, very high quality. Um, she has never written a novel. She's, she's, she's written two novellas. Uh, trauma has been uh, uh, an increasing concern throughout her writing. So uh, each, uh, each writer, in her own way, I think addressed the... Um, the, the trauma, the experiences of, um, of, of the people of modern Korea, but uh, in very different ways. And in fact, um, Oh Jung-hee in the 1990s um, uh, began to despair of ever having a wide audience. And so she resorted to a, another genre of... Um, a rather lesser known genre, at least outside of Korea, of, um, of modern fiction. And this um, we would call the, the uh, anecdote, uh, the anecdotal story, which is about half the length of a traditional story or maybe even shorter, often dealing with a single incident, often involving the family or one's uh, friends or community. And she reduced um, she reduced two two volumes of these. They're they're quite good, but um, these are the two writers that um, that uh, transformed uh, women writers in Korea from being known as yoriujaka, which is a which is a gendered term that literally means writers of the female species, and there's no male counterpart term. To, uh, to being referred to simply as women writers, yes, and Jaka, which, which is a neutral term. Um, and something that I, 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 I only get into um, uh, in chapter 10, the most recent chapter of what is Korean literature, and, I, and I, I, uh, it bears reminding that... Um, um, that the first nine chapters of this book originated in, in a manuscript by Professor Guan, whereas chapter 10 uh, is, is my work alone. Um, but in chapter 10, I uh, emphasize what I see as the, uh, what enabled a breakthrough for women, or, or t what I understand as uh, a kind of a broadening of the presence of women among Korean fiction writers from these two seminal figures to uh, a much more widespread presence, and that is the IMF movement in the 1990s, which um, accounted not just for a remarkable and sudden gender shift among writers themselves, but also uh, in uh, scholarship, in Korean literature scholarship in Korea. Well, let's um let's pause on that IMF moment actually, um because and let's go back a little bit before it. I, I'm going to focus on that um, historical consciousness point and that idea of trauma literature. Sure, I, I might do so in a, through some of your books 
And I'm going to go back to one that's a little bit older now, but something that you wrote is still the most, I'm going to quote you here, the most important one volume Korean novel published since 1945. And that's The Dwarf. Mm -hmm. So let's go back to that yes. period. Again, focusing on the trauma around and the dislocation within society and that novel and why it's so important. Okay. So um, this, is, this is a terrific story. Um, Joe Sehi, the author, debuted in the uh, 1960s, so in the 1960s, rather. Um, he's one of a remarkable group of writers, uh, many of them, uh, a majority of them male, uh, many of them uh, what we might think of as socially engaged writers. But he really didn't publish much of anything until, until the mid-1970s. So what's happening in the mid-1970s? Well, this is when... Uh, Park Chung-hee's program of export-led industrialization really takes off. So I, I think in 1972 it was, uh, he had had the Constitution amended to uh, what was called the Yushin, uh, or often termed in English the Revitalizing Constitution. So this had all the right kind of buzzwords attached to it you know, pure elements, uh, everybody onward and upward. But uh, that came with a decrease in civil liberties. And um, uh, and Joe Sehi's response to this was to write these linked stories. Uh, they could each stand alone. Indeed, they each can stand alone. But they're, uh, they're linked by uh, a concern for... Um, uh, social problems, um, class divisions, political problems, but also, and Joseph, he should be recognized as one of the first environmentally conscious writers in uh, in modern Korea. Uh, so he had he had something to say. He had something to say uh, about the um, about the environment, about the political situation, about the economic situation, about class, uh, about gender. Uh, but he wanted this, uh, he wanted these stories, he wanted this book to, to get published. And the only way he was able to do this was to be subtle in the extreme. But the way he did this, and this is brilliant, he chose a style, a literary style, uh, basically uh, that made the book uh, accessible to anyone with a middle school education. So the writing is deceptively simple. Uh, uh, syntactically, it is extremely simple, but it, it, it retains a strong sense of irony. And... Um, and in terms of characterization, he basically represented um, the the two you know ongoing levels of uh, the Korean social structure: the haves and the have-nots. The haves being the uh, being the educated people, um, and the and the have-nots being um, what would traditionally been the the farmers, the the artisans, and the and the merchants. But in addition to that, we have we have a third uh, social stratum, and that is an emerging middle class. And so we see in all of these we see in all of these stories um, we see how these various issues um, are embodied in in these three different uh, social strata. And then, uh, uh, and and his his approach succeeded remarkably. the uh, The book um, is, I, I am guessing, it is the best selling work of literary fiction, the best single volume work of literary fiction. Uh, it went through more than one hundred printings from. Uh, one of the elite publishers of literary fiction in Seoul, Moon Hak Kwa Ji Sung Sa, mm. familiarly referred to as Munji. And then Joe Sehi decided that his dwarf, he used to <laughs> refer to the book as his dwarf, had um, had made enough profits for, for Munji. And so uh, subsequent printings have been through uh, 
uh, a very small publisher uh, operated by a family friend. Uh, and finally, um, his use of, of the, um, the, the eponym in the title, The Dwarf, is, is another stroke of genius. Mm. So I often ask my students, what's the difference between a dwarf and a midget? Well, a midget is a perfectly proportioned person who happens to be very small. A dwarf, on the other hand, is, um, uh, has a normally sized trunk, but stunted limbs and often an oversized head. Uh, what's, so what's the big deal? Well, the, um, um, the idea is uh, uh, disproportionate economic development. So here we have an eponym that stands for, uh, for, for something that's out of proportion. And um, so put together the characterization, the, the subject matter, so the, the attention, the, the historical consciousness, uh, the, the attention to, and this is another buzzword for the, for the Korean literature mm-hmm. power structure, henshil, reality, the present. Uh, with an emphasis on um, on both bad stuff and good, and usually more of an emphasis on bad stuff and good stuff that's going on right now. So, so put that together, and uh, you have uh, a work of literature that succeeds in terms of uh, of theme, that succeeds in terms of literary style, and uh, succeeds in terms of readership. I've been rereading The Dwarf throughout the week in preparation here. And just listen to you speak about it. I'm seeing it from different angles again for the second time. It's a brilliant book. Uh, but I, we are, let's press on to another book of yours. Now, this is pre-publication. I pre-ordered a copy. It's not out yet. The book is called One Left. And it is, it's a book hmm. focused on another aspect of this uh, trauma literature. I have to assume, have not read it, but the subject matter is, is fascinating. And not just fascinating and, and, and horrific, but really deep within the modern identity of Koreans today. So that is uh, comfort women and the issue there. So take us to your, right. your newest book, uh, One Left, and what we should expect and the issues around it. Right. Um, so uh, we, we uh, you know, I, I'm, I should ask you, Chan, how, how we, we came to, to know about this particular book. By all means. We knew about the writer. I, I knew about the, reader, the writer for, for maybe 10 years or so. At least, uh, I think, one or perhaps two of my students had translated her in my, um, in my Korean language, uh, my fourth year Korean language course at UBC, where students learn to read and translate uh, literary, Korean literary short fiction. Um, but once we um, once we once we discovered this book, uh, we knew that we we had to translate it. Uh, for one thing, and this was the first question that was asked to us by uh, Justin Maki, who's a who's a uh, correspondent for Kyoto News, which you might think of as a Japanese counterpart to the Korean Yonhap uh, Newswire Agency. Uh, the first question he asked us was, "Why did it take 70 years for uh, for someone to write uh, to write this novel? It's it's the first novel that focuses exclusively on on these young women, these girls." Um, and the answer is, um, uh, "This is is just this is an incendiary remains an incendiary uh, period uh, and part of." Um, of um, of modern Korean history, um, uh, to maybe give you a better idea of this, uh, let me let me briefly mention um, uh, an anthology of colonial period writing that I did with uh, my mentor Kim Chong Un. Um, Kim Chong Un himself wrote uh, a, a very engaging volume of post-war fiction, that is, stories from the fifties and sixties that usually deal with the wreckage of, uh, of post-war Korea. And uh, I once asked him, why is it that we have very little Korean fiction about 
actual battlefield, um, you know, scenes. Uh, why do we have very few war stories in Korean fiction? Whereas um, in English, I, I think I once did a, uh, I once went online and I think I counted uh, 500 book length works of fiction and nonfiction written by Americans about the Korean War. And his response to the question, why isn't there more war stories written by Koreans? He said, it's simply too painful. Um, and he himself was a veteran. Um, so uh, obviously the, the comfort women issue um, uh, is painful. Uh, it has to be painful. More than 200,000 girls were taken from their homes. Uh, multiply this by by what, five people in a family? You've got millions of people whose family members were directly affected by this. But you've also got um, issues of recrimination about ideology during the colonial period. Why? Because um, Korean colonial officials were complicit in the recruitment of these girls or mm. in, in their kidnapping is what it often amounted to. Uh, and um, for this reason, uh, at least two scholars I know of, both female of the Comfort Women, they're sociologists, pioneering scholars of, uh, of Comfort Women scholarship, uh, are now retired and they have, um, you know, they've been attacked uh, yes. verbally for, for their research. So uh, this remains a very, very touchy subject. But again, what Kim uh, what Kim Soon did is, um, uh, uh, which is what any good writer does, is to match the style of, of his or her narrative to the subject matter. So um, what Kim Soon did was she rigorously researched all the testimony um, of the Comfort Women, which started, I think, back in 1991. I think that's when the first, um, when Kim Hak Soon went public. Uh, so she um, not only researched all of these narratives, but she used them for much of the detail in the novel uh, to the extent that she has over 200 endnotes. Oh. Uh, which refer the great majority of them referring to uh, to specific women. So uh, what she has done basically is to combine uh, historical research uh, with a fictional narrative, um, and it's uh, it's an approach uh, that some some pre-publication reviewers uh, found it very distasteful. Uh, one person used the term voyeuristic, but uh, what she is doing is just providing us with testimony. She's providing us with historical detail, uh, which allows us to uh, contextualize the fictional part of the story, which um, is related by a, uh, by a former comfort woman now in her 90s in, uh, in, uh, in a neighborhood of Seoul that faces uh, urban reconstruction, which very few people live. So it's kind of a parallel to the shadow existence. She has always lived as a former comfort woman. Um, but that is uh, that. Um, so it, it's a very, it's a very good blend of historical background and a compelling fictional narrative, uh, which uh, allows us to follow this woman as she follows the ever decreasing numbers of, uh, of of how many grandmothers, as, as they're called, who, who who survive, until at the end of the novel, only one is left. And she, I get kind of emotional about this. But mm. She makes a, she makes a very courageous uh, decision to um, abandon her anonymity and to go to the hospital. Where the sole surviving uh, how many is on her deathbed to t to tell her that uh, when you are gone there will still be one left. So um, this is uh, 
um, this this is a novel that we felt had to be translated, but uh, you would probably find it hard to difficult hard to believe how difficult it was for us to uh, to secure publication. Uh, I think that's that's a very long and perhaps a different story. But mm. um, this is, um, I think, this this kind of novel is one of the reasons that Ju Chan and I. Um, and became engaged with literary translation as a lifelong profession 40 years ago. And uh, it's novels like um, One Left, Han Myung, literally one person in the Korean, that uh, that keep us coming back again and again to, um, to, to, to translation, not as a mercenary um, uh, enterprise, but as a way of uh, of connecting a uh, a Korean author and his or her work to uh, to an international audience. Well, I I can't wait to get my copy to read it. After that, that's uh, such an interesting description. Uh, from that as well. Well, consider consider the consider the. <laughs> consider there to be a copy on its way to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I I honestly can't wait and. I, it's again reading the blurb uh it's all i've had access to of course but you write about how how uh it is a complex moral statement here in so many ways you talk about uh uh these women arriving back in korea and becoming social outcasts and there's some of the this real complex morality and i have to assume that that was also one of the things that drove you to another to another recent publication of yours which is the catcher in the loft which is a recently published book of yours and inspired by a very real case by a true story of a torture specialist during the 1980s. Again, a hugely significant period in Korean life and a Korean life and a period that seems to have, again, really impacted modern Korean identity. So as the last book we look at, tell us about this book and why it's so important. Well, um, the author, Chun and Young, has... Um, has always been interested in uh, in dualities and um, uh, for example North Korea South Korea uh, good and evil that's uh, um, again I guess that that's that is kind of a natural uh, for an author to talk about <clears throat> but uh, what um, <clears throat> the uh, inspiration if I can call it that for the Catcher in the Loft, and I should mention that the uh, the original title is Sengang, and uh, Miss Chun, um, it, it took her quite some time to settle on a title. I remember we had a little bit of consultation about that, but she finally decided on, on Sengang as, uh, again, as a, a kind of emphasis of the duality of, um, you know, bitterness, but again, uh, uh, perhaps sweetness, uh, any, anyway, she um, uh, she was, I guess, um, shocked, appalled, dismayed, disturbed, surprised when the historical figure in question was, uh, who was a fugitive for several years, but then uh, turned himself in, served out his jail term. And when he was released from jail, he became a minister. He became a moksha. And so she's she's thinking, how is it possible for someone who is a professional torturer uh, to become a minister? Um, and I guess by implication, a, a, a healer. So um, uh, this was the inspiration for the novel. But again, she did something. Um, she did something brilliant and she did not simply focus on the torture operative himself but on a counterpart so um, in the in the two novellas of trauma that Juchan and I translate in the red room we have a dual narrative of uh, in one case of the victimizer and the victim in another case of a uh, of, a, of an unsuspecting family member and uh, a person who's been traumatized. And in The Catcher in the Loft, we have an unsuspecting family member uh, with uh, with a father whom she has always thought of as a patriotic uh, 
policeman, uh, and he had no idea that he was a torture operative. So uh, what Chen and Yang has done is kind of introduce um, a, a very much an issue-driven narrative with a coming-of-age story on the part of the daughter. And uh, I think that's that's what makes this uh, what's what makes this story succeed. And uh, like uh, like uh, other good works of trauma literature that Ju Chun and I have translated, we have um, a um, we have a portrait of how uh, trauma affects individuals. So. Uh, in the catcher in the loft, the daughter um, ends up uh, having a liaison with one of her father's victims, and so we see not only um, we we see not only trauma in terms of the victim and the victimized, but how that trauma affects significant others, family members, um, and, and, and other individuals. So. Um, uh, we consider this particular novel to be one of the better written novels that we've translated, and uh, forgive us for saying this, but we consider this as one of our better translations. And again, it it, it really helps when an author uh, when an author structures um, a novel uh, imbues it with a with an appropriate narrative style. It it really, uh, I think it really it really helps the outcome of the translation. Well, again, uh, again, a fascinating look in, uh, into lit not just literature, but what a translation that sounds like. Now, before we finish this, there are two questions that I must ask you. And the first one, of course, is a theme that many listeners may have already picked up on running through uh, the history of Korean literature and into the modern era that we've touched on. But you emphasized this a lot uh, recently and how just how important this is to understand Korean literature. So what is intertextuality and intermediality? And why are they so important uh, in understanding uh, the, the, bre uh, the, the breadth yes. of Korean literature? Yeah, uh, th this is uh, there's a little bit of irony here because um, the uh, the Korean literature establishment, and I'm guessing uh, scholarly disciplines in general. I'm sure this is true of of, uh, of art history, music history. Uh, the the scholarship, learning, textbooks tend to be very compartmentalized. So. Um, uh, the, the usual approach, and, and, and that is the approach um, uh, pretty much for, of what is Korean literature. Um, uh, we, we list uh, uh, the major genres, a lot of the major figures, uh, a lot of the major themes. But um, the danger, of course, in such, approach, in such an approach is things get compartmentalized and uh, we end up not realizing how interconnected these various genres are, how interconnected modern is with pre-modern. And um, uh, one way in which I came to an understanding of intertextuality was through a project initiated by my colleague Ross King uh, on parody stories. Uh, this I think he he must have started in on this about 20 years ago, and then um, um, he and I worked uh, together on this about 15 years ago. We had a we had a feature in Octocoreana magazine. Several of our students uh, in our Korean language courses have translated parody stories, and so um, this uh, the takeaway I had from that project was how um, Korean folk stories and um, how Korean folk stories have survived uh, through the centuries, through the millennia, uh, in various forms and in modern literature in terms of modern, usually short fiction. I think there may be one or two novel-length works. And that, in turn, led me to a realization of how iconic cultural figures in Korea have uh, 
have continued to live not just in literature, but also in film, uh, on the stage, and uh, even in K-pop. So um, one presentation that I like to make um, in the last year or two, and it's in conjunction with what is Korean literature, I start the presentation with a... Uh, a clip from Im Kwon Tech's film of the Chunyang story, the uh, one of Korea's best known and best loved stories about the uh, the daughter of an entertaining woman who um, who inherits her mother's uh, outcast uh, status, but, um, and uh, um, a young uh, uh, the son of an elite family is smitten with her and. Um, and the story is about all the problems this, uh, that, that occur until the, uh, the deliverance and the happy ending. But, uh, uh, Im Gwon Tech uh, made a wonderful film of this story. And, uh, uh, what really makes this film successful is he uses the frame of an actual Pansori performance in Jungdong Theater in downtown Seoul about 20 years ago mm. as the beginning of uh, uh, of this film. So in my presentation, I start with the, uh, the, the first clip from the film, which in itself is, is intertextual or intermedial, showing a uh, stage production. Then the film itself, and then I end my presentation with a K-pop song by Lizzie, who's a member of the After School Idol group, uh, singing a song called Not an Easy Girl, which is kind of a parody of the Im Kwon Tech film. And um, this, uh, I think, is, is just a wonderful example of how um, uh, of how the best known stories, the, the best known figures in the Korean tradition remain alive uh, thousands of years later and um, are, are uh, expanding not just from, uh, from representation on the printed page, but uh, into our increasingly digital and, uh, and visual era. So, um, also, uh, and I'm certainly not alone in this, and I hope I don't sound too op opportunistic, okay. but um, uh, literature is, uh, you've probably heard this before, but, um, but literature is, uh, print literature, fiction, is, is dying in Korea uh, to the extent that publishers now are averse to publishing novels. Um, believe it or not. Mm. So, um, uh, sales, uh, well, sales of, um, book sales in Korea, uh, have always been more weighted toward, uh, translations. So in a typical year, uh, 60% of the books sold in Korea were, uh, were not written in Korean. And I'm talking about all books, uh, not simply fiction. I would say that that probably remains true of fiction and translation versus fiction written in Korean. So um, it's, uh, um, uh, it, it is absolutely essential for me, and this is something I would want to do anyway, to uh, emphasize to my Korean literature students that, uh, that what they're seeing today in the form of, uh, of manhwa, of, uh, of graphic novels, uh, K-pop, um, uh, other forms of popular cultural expression are, are intimately tied to the Korean literary tradition. And uh, if you don't believe me, ask my uh, ask my colleague Cedar Bao Seiji, who's a uh, who's a specialist in uh, in in performance in in Korean culture. So uh, from that as well. So that's you mentioned there. So as a very last question. You mentioned there about the importance of that literary history and, and just where we are today. So my last question is on that as well, is uh, looking back after all these years and all this work that you've put into the field and you've seen it change so much over the years, how do you analyze the current 
field of Korean literature uh, being translated into English. Uh, what are your hopes for it? What, oh, you, what, what, what are your criticisms of it? And I know, as I've just asked you, a very broad question there, but I, I wonder how you see things well, today. Okay, I, uh, I'm going to be very... Um, I'm going to be very upfront about this. I think, uh, I think the last 10 years, um, not, not to mention that there have been some positive points, but I think the last 10 years have been a disaster for Korean fiction, contemporary Korean fiction in, in, in English translation. Uh, and, I, and I'm not talking about poetry. I would love to see more translations of Korean drama uh, and especially a female dramatist, of which there seem to be virtually none. Um, Korean poetry and translation remains remains very strong, representative. We're seeing uh, uh, an increase in uh, in women poets, although uh, Korean poetry uh, today s still remains a, a strongly masculine enterprise. But the translation of Korean fiction, I think, has been has been compromised by the lack of uh, of standards of professional conduct. Um, uh, the role of the translator has been reduced from uh, a partner who enters into a relationship with an author uh, by his or her or their own free will to a kind of a factotum who is commissioned with uh, exclamation, uh, with quotation marks, i.e. paid to translate a writer who is selected by uh, a literary agent or a publishing company or by a Korean foundation as a must read for, uh, for foreign readers. Um, the uh, I, I'm I, I'm I'm really dismayed by um, by uh, the breakdown, for example, in relationships between uh, between uh, authors and translators. Um, I'm dismayed at. Uh, unrealistic expectations of, of authors and their agents. Uh, I'm dismayed that translations that Ju Chun and I have not done cannot be published because an agent cannot find a publisher that will pay what he or she thinks he or uh, his or her author uh, uh, deserves. Um, uh, I or have witnessed the, the breakdown of relationships between um, writers and their translators, writers and their agents. We ourselves have suffered uh, a, a, a rupture in a relationship with at least two of our writers. Three, I guess I could say. Um, so I, I'll be completely candid in admitting that we have personally been affected by this, but um, uh, trying to be as objective as I can, I see that what is getting published is related very much to um, what uh, gains visibility in, in English. This has always been... Um, a compelling argument by the Korean literary establishment. Oh, this uh, recognition, in the, especially in the form of a prize. Mm. Um, this uh, oh, doesn't this reflect so well in how uh, how far we have come in our literature? And yet, the current uh, director of uh, what's now called Literature Translation Institute Korea, Hangul Munak Banyak One. Uh, is on record as saying at a conference I attended last fall at the University of Michigan that Korean literature is still very much under construction, meaning it's still very much in a in a process of development. Mm. And uh, I'm, I'm sure that there are many reasons for this, uh, not the least of which is the ongoing division between North Korea and South Korea. But... Um, 
what we're seeing translated, at least by the commercial publishers, um, are, is, is based on, uh, on, um, on initial favorable reception, which translates into, oh, we have to keep pushing and paying people to translate these authors. And um, uh, works of, of Korean fiction that are not necessarily author specific, which would be the case with Kim Sumo and with Chun Un Young and The Catcher in the Loft, um, don't get nearly the attention from uh, publishers, representatives, the uh, the agents who represent them, and translators, as do the uh, the names of people who have made it into translation English, such as Kim Young Ha, mm. uh, Shin Kyung Suk, and Han Kang. So. Um, I, I for one, um, uh, hope that the Korean literature establishment will abandon their support of this uh, of this approach to to translating Korean literature into uh, Korean fiction. I should say, contemporary Korean fiction into English. Do you expect that they will change this approach, or, or I? No, I don't. I think it's I think it's going to get worse. Okay. Well. Uh... Again, on that theme, that slightly uh, uh, pessimistic scene, but of course thoughtful look back on Korean literature, uh, this is probably a good place to leave the podcast on. Uh, I'm painfully aware of how much of your time I've taken up, Bruce. Um, but it... Oh, this is not an issue. And, and, and Jed, might, might I say my kind of closing... Um, Please do, yes. Um, statement or um, I don't want my pessimistic my admittedly pessimistic contents on the present state of contemporary Korean fiction in translation to um, to delude listeners into thinking that I feel pessimistic about the Korean literary tradition as a whole that is nothing could be further from the truth um, I intend to continue to champion the Korean literary tradition as a whole in both its recorded and its oral foundations. And uh, uh, I continue to think that um, this is, is kind of an undiscovered uh, uh, jewel of, uh, of the Korean cultural tradition. So uh, I, I hope your listeners will, will keep in mind that um, my 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 overall um, feelings toward the Korean uh, literary tradition are only stronger, if anything. Well, uh, people like myself will keep ha keep watching for your newest publications and reading the ones that come out over time. So uh, you do have an audience out there, and it's a large one. Uh, but so I have to link below the podcast, of course, so many books that we've mentioned today, but it's going to be tricky. So what I'm going to do, I am going to link below the, um, of course, the, the text, What is Korean Literature? And of course, uh, the three other novels that we focused on most predominantly, One Left, The Dwarf, and The Catcher in the Loft. And I cannot recommend to listeners enough how much, uh, how much wonderful content is there and how much these reads are important, not just in literary works, but for their impact on Korean history and life. And also I need to tell listeners how little we got to in that actual text of what is Korean literature. It really was a, a real brief look at the period. So again, so much more there for listeners to go and read for themselves. Um, again, on that. Great, and and mm. and please, Jed, uh, r recall that uh, what is Korean literature? Uh, at least half of the credit for that goes to Professor Guan, and at least half the credit for the other three books goes to uh, my good wife, Chu Chan Fulton. Yes, I must. I keep I keep making that mistake. So <laughs> um, yeah, absolutely. So again, those that that will be a reference below for listeners to go and read for themselves. On that, Bruce Fulton, it's been an absolute pleasure, a rare treat. Thanks so much for coming on the Korean Hour podcast. Same here, and you're very welcome, Jed. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of the podcast. I really hope you enjoyed it. 
This is just a final reminder that we've made a conscious decision here on the Korean Ad Podcast not to run advertising. And so the podcast is entirely funded by you, the listener. So if you do want it to continue, please consider supporting the podcast at the PayPal or Patreon links attached below. Or importantly, you can share, like, or comment on the podcast across social media. And on that, I hope to see you again for the next episode. Thanks again for listening. 